Hello and welcome to City Theater Celebrates Black History Month. I am Montez Freeland. I'm an actor, director, playwright, and the associate producer at City Theater. And today I'm joined by a brilliant group of artists who have graced many stages who I love to watch perform. And they've been on screens all around Pittsburgh and beyond. And we're going to bridge that generational gap through a chat about Black artists that have helped shape the artistic landscape in Pittsburgh, most notably Dr. Vernell Lilly, Bob Johnson, and Don Marshall. But I'm going to brag on our panelists just a little bit, so give me a couple of minutes to do so. First up, we have Mr. Brendan Pfeiffer, who is an actor and graduate of the University of Pittsburgh. Brendan has performed at a number of local theaters, but I think one of his first introductions to the theater community here was his virtuosic turn in I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And he played about 10 different characters or something like that, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 11, 11, 10. 11, <laughs> he played 11. <laughs> but you may have also seen him in City Theater's production of One Night in Miami, directed by Reg Douglas. And he will also be seen in the upcoming feature film, House of Stones, for which he is also co-creator and co-producer. Thanks for being here, B. Absolutely, man. It's always a pleasure to be here with you, Tez, and to be with City Theater. Awesome. Next, coming onto your screen is Miss Shakira Wright, who has been on stage since she was a child. <laughs> and I've been watching her on stage since she was a young person. And uh, she is a graduate of Point Park University and one of the key members, possibly a founding member of the Alumni Theater Company, where she is currently a mentor and the artistic consultant. And you may have also seen her on stage in shows such as School Girls or the African Mean Girls Play and Passing Strange. Welcome, Ms. Wright, how are you? I am so wonderful, how are you? Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm good, thank you, thank you for being here. And next, we have, we, we had a living legend with us today, Miss Etta Cox. Now, we do not have enough time to run down the long, wonderful resume and the awards, but I'm going to try. Okay, so Miss Cox what, uh, has performed on Broadway in I Love My Wife, the 1940s Radio Hour, and The Me Nobody Knows, then came to Pittsburgh and took over, and she was named the Pittsburgh Performer of the Year in 1999 and was voted best jazz vocalist in Pittsburgh for eight consecutive years and have performed in a host of shows at City Theater. Please welcome Miss Etta Cox. Hello, hello, hello. Good to Hi. see you. Good to see all of you. Yes, yes. And we have uh, someone who I'm calling my co-host, the amazingly warm and talented Bria Walker. Bria is an actor, singer, director, and educator, and is the current head of MFA in performance pedagogy at the University of Pittsburgh. And I think I first met Bria when we did a show together called The Sisters Gray a while back at the August Wilson Center. But I'm always excited to share the stage or watch you on stage whenever she is performing. And one of my favorites is The Royale, uh, which you did at City Theater. So hi, Bria. Hi, Tess. How you doing? Good, good, good. Ms. Cox, you can come back on. Oh, okay. You know? so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the gang is all here now. I didn't, I'm done. I didn't give you intros. I'm over. It's done. <laughs> well, I thank y'all for joining me tonight. And basically, well, before we get into all that, I'm going to pass it over to Bria. I'm going to let Bria handle some uh, little fun icebreakers with us. We're going to get started with some questions for our panel, um, getting to know them a little bit. And I think a fun question we have for y'all is what Pittsburgh performance has stuck with you as an audience member? And so I know, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good ones. And so I'll go to Shakira first. You saw me make that, ooh, I'm not sure. I've seen All three of y'all did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought of One Night in Miami, mm. which was very fantastic. And I also thought of another city theater show Pipeline. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. And why did those two stick out to you so much? 
I love seeing black people on stage mm -hmm. and seeing our stories told, but I also was taken by the direction. Uh, I feel like City Theater always really shows out when it comes to telling a story in a unique and really riveting way that kind of keeps you really close and wanting to know more about the story. So I think that's that's what it is for me. That's lovely, that's lovely. Miss Etta, what about you? Well, um, being the senior member here, uh, I'm gonna go back a few years and I do not, and Mark would know the name of the show, but it was with that one man show with Don Marshall. Ropes in. And, was it? Ropes in? Ropes, yes. I, I was just totally captivated by his performance and I have done shows with him over the years and he's, he was such a, such a great performer. He played my husband, I think, in one of the shows at City Theater called Spunk. Yeah. And uh, we had a great time until he ate all that garlic. But other than that, you know, it was a lot of fun. But he was <laughs> fabulous. He was fabulous. Yeah. So was it um, Man Who Lived Underground or Ropes In? That's it. Man Who Lived Underground. Man that's it. Under that's it. He, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Because he had two great... Uh, yeah. uh, Man Who Lived Underground. Underground. Yeah, which he that worked with it. Mark on. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, he was so good. So good. Yeah, he was. Brendan, how about you? Yes, uh, I got to go back. I got to go all the way back to the first show, the first professional show that I saw in Pittsburgh, which was at the new Hazlitt and or Hazlitt. I'm not from Pittsburgh, so I, I hear both. I hear both from time to time. Hazlitt, Hazlitt. Hazlitt. Um, That's what I'm going to go with. Um, it was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest uh, with, I want to say, Patrick yeah. Cannon. Yeah. Patrick There's Jordan. Two, Patrick Jordan. Patrick Jordan. There's two yeah. super talented Patricks in Pittsburgh. Right. Patrick Cannon right. and Patrick Jordan. Um, yeah, Patrick Jordan and um, Dana Griffith, I mm -hmm. think. And also Reese Redwood was in that as uh, one of the guards. And I, I was just taken aback. I just went um, with kind of like a little pits, pit arts uh, field trip uh, with a couple of friends. And I, I just was stunned by the level of performances, the aura of the space. Like I was completely engrossed with uh, what Pittsburgh theater could be and what it could look like. It was unfamiliar to me. Uh, and so that show really, really stood out for for like the, the theatrical potential that, that Pittsburgh is always sitting on. Yeah, that was a bare bones production. Mm -hmm. And Patrick Jordan, who is an artistic um, director is also an alum of Pitt. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of party tonight. <laughs> I don't know, right? <laughs> Taking over. What about you, Montez? <laughs> um, I think my, I think mine would be, I think it was two trains running that um, Pittsburgh Playwrights did that had Anthony Chisholm in it and Salo Dean and Jonathan Berry, uh, Sharnice Thompson and a couple, uh, oh, who else? Was Eugene Lee in that one? I think Eugene Lee may have been in that one. Um, but it was it was my first time going to see a Pittsburgh Playwrights show. And so it was in the small, uh, you know, theater. It had like booths set up and like cars on the stage. <laughs> it was all kinds of stuff. But it was, you know, part of the set. Yeah. Uh, and Bill Nunn actually took me to go see it, like took a group of us. And I was like, what? What is this? So it was amazing. I was wow. talking about it um, with a close friend the other day about how great it was and seeing Chiz on stage for the first time. It was, I'll never forget it. Yeah. More legends. Mr. I know. Bill Nunn, you so, know. Yes, for sure. What yeah. about you, Bria? Ugh, I have to like piggyback on Miss Etta because... My um my uncle D and 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 for me it was Robeson. Um I mean we'll, we'll, uh, teaser, you know, we'll get into that later. <laughs> but um yeah, that was um that performance was pivotal for me. Um watching him in Robeson do that. Uh yeah, lots of connections, lots of fond memories with that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Well, should we jump into it? 
and start honoring some folks. So, you know, when um, this came about, I was like thinking like, what could we do at City Theater to sort of, you know, for Black History Month? And, um, you know, in the past year, we lost a lot of people for sure. But I, you know, I kept thinking about all the people that we lost and the stories that maybe we won't ever get to hear again, at least from them. But I do think it's our responsibility to carry it on. And so we were thinking about honoring uh, Dr. Vernell Lilly and Don Marshall. And when I reached out to Tomei Cousin, he was like, you should also think about um, Bob Johnson. And I was like, okay, okay. I don't know who that is, but okay. <laughs> and so I had to like go back in my head. And I remember Dr. Lilly used to always ask me, you know, about Bob Johnson and tell me about him. And then I started to research him. So does anyone here know who Bob Johnson was? I don't know a lot of his history. Mm. See, Tomei is good for that. Tomei will give you some history and you'll be like, okay. I'll be like, you were there <laughs> for all this. He He's probably like, was. <laughs> <laughs> so I started like, so I, started, I just like started looking at Bob Johnson and I found out he's from New York. He's a director and choreographer and he trained at, you know, the famed New York school, the high school of performing arts, eventually danced with Catherine, Catherine Dunham and then was a part of the New York Shakespeare's Festival first production of Hair and then came to Pittsburgh. And I mean, not just like came, but I think he came to work on um, something called as a dance consultant for Project Self-Esteem. And mm. that's how University of Pitt, uh, I feel like they should sponsor this <laughs> tonight, but the University of Pitt- I know, uh, right? Brought him in to teach uh, drama and dance in their black studies department. And that's where he stayed until 1986, until he passed. But while he was here, uh, in 1970, he founded the Pittsburgh Black Theater Dance Ensemble, yes. and uh, their mission was to shed light on the breadth of culture in the African diaspora and to bring attention to issues facing the community, but to do it through dance. Mm. So that was like, I was like, what? I didn't know any of this stuff. It's just crazy That's what you beautiful. can Right, exactly. And a lot of it happened um, down in Oakland as well and you know in those places and um and i also heard maybe from the chat <laughs> that he was <laughs> in the show at city called day of the picnic uh and he may have taken um mark masterson of city theater to see uh wilson's jitney on craft avenue which is like crazy and i know I, alfred kirschman who used to work at the uh playhouse he did the set for that production i believe <laughs> um, so uh, but it's crazy how you can just ask somebody a question and they can just tell you a whole lot of information about someone who you didn't know. And so that's what I did since Tomei brought him up and he couldn't be here today. I was like, well, let me ask you a couple questions about Bob Johnson. And so you're about to see our conversation about Mr. Johnson. So enjoy. And then we will come right back. All right. So we are here with Tomei Cousin. And uh, we're going to talk about Mr. Bob Johnson, who was somebody who, admittedly, I don't, I don't know so so much about him. So, who was Bob Johnson? Uh, Bob Johnson was the founder and the artistic director of Pittsburgh Black Dance Theater. So he would be to, for the larger, you know, community. He would be um, like a, a, a Alvin Ailey to the local community or to an Arthur Mitchell. He founded. Pittsburgh Black Dance basically here and just kind of launched so many careers and had a wonderful, wonderful school over on the Y on the hill. Uh, so that's where the company rehearsed. Um, I think uh, Greer Reed is one of his, she was a young, she was a young, young girl when I first met her, she was a young teen in the company. <clears throat> Leslie Anderson, who teaches at Kappa was one of the principal dancers when she kind of come back to the city. And then she took over after Bob. Well, he, I would say he's like the father of Pittsburgh Black Dance. That's amazing. It's stuff you learn mm -hmm. <laughs> just by asking a question. Mm -hmm. So how were, um, how were you two introduced or how did you meet and how was he influential in your life? Right. Um, I came to Pittsburgh in uh, 1978 to attend Point Park College and we did not have a Black dance teacher. You know, it was that temple. Um, there was no one there. And I was very interested in finding um, a Black 
dance teacher, <laughs> just period. And then also um, a different kind of way of moving. And so through through channels, there used to be the Oakland School of Theater Dance, which was in, on Oakland on Forbes Avenue, directly across the street from the King's Court, you know, that, that building that looks like a uh, castle. I yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, it, um, it used to um, used to be a dance studio there, right there on the corner, and it was and it was a Dunham studio. So it was run by a woman named Catherine uh, Kathy Powell, and Kathy Powell taught Dunham class, and and everyone would come and take and they had all the drummers there and, and everything. And then one day Bob came into class, and um, he just said, "Well, who who are you?" And I said, "My name is Tomei, and I'm here. I'm here, dance major at Point Park." And he said, "Oh, would you be interested in coming to take class with my company?" And so he kind of invited me over there and I went and took a few classes with the company. And, and I, I think it was the first time I, since I had been very young that I had a black male or black person period, you know, instructing dance. It was a big deal for me to be in, in his room as well as all black dancers, you know? And, uh, and I didn't know any of them, you know, because I was from the schools so they were all local people. So that was my introduction to him. And then he invited me to join the company, but of course I could not because of the conflicts of classes and rehearsals. And so we never actually ever got to work together, um, which was an unfortunate and still I, I'm very sad that that never actually happened or collaborate on anything for, for that matter either. But he encouraged me when I started doing being a choreographer, he would come see the work. We ended up on several shows. The dance council used to have something called the choreographer's continuum. And Bob would always have a work and I would always have a work. And we would talk about each other's work and he would always give me pointers about choreography, about direction. So he kind of encouraged and supported a career even though we were never around each other, you know? And he was such a giving, knowledgeable man. I mean, he really knew what he was doing and a great deal of um, emotion and pride. That's what I remember. He wanted the performers to have so to have confidence, emotion and pride, you know? Uh, and so that was his trademark, I would say. Wow, I think we got to find some ways to find books or anything or create this stuff to sort of talk about these people. And, yeah, you know, specifically in Pittsburgh and, mm -hmm. and how I, instrumental they were. I think I, I th I'm pretty sure that that there his archives are at the University of Pittsburgh. So I think you can people can dive in there. I've not seen them myself. So something just like we should do a trip. <laughs> we should do a trip because it would be worth seeing. He, I remember he had some wonderful, wonderful ballets uh, that would just like blow the roof off those festivals, like the Three Rivers Arts Festival. People would just go nuts, you know, over the work. He was um, a very, um, you know, he was very long, very tall, very elegant, you know, long limbed, and you know, and he kind of moved like a like a snake. He was very, very charming, you know, great, but wonderful performer, wonderful artist. Well, thank you. This is this is great. This is going to start me probably on a crazy rabbit hole. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Knocking on doors and calling right. people, asking about Bob John. I was actually when I was living in Oakland, and Dr. Lily came to pick me up one day uh, to take me to rehearsal, and she was like, "You live in Bob Johnson's house," and I was like, "What?" Oh, wow. And I was like, "What are you talking about?" Wow. And she's like, "You live in this house," and I was like, "Okay, I don't know who that is, but thanks for the ride." Yeah. <laughs> So. Yeah, that's cool. That's fantastic. Yeah. They did a lot of collaborations together, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, Dr. Lily. I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. I appreciate Yay. that. And we're going to keep learning because we have yeah. to. That's Absolutely. Bro. Yeah. Thank you, Montez. Thank you. Okay. So we hope y'all enjoyed those little nuggets of history that Tome dropped on me and probably <laughs> on y'all too. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed it. And we're going to we're gonna say thank you to Mr. Bob Johnson for all that he did for our community and that still lives in the air here. And we honor him. We honor him today. Mm -hmm. And we're going to continue the honor and move on to talk about Mr. Don Marshall, someone else who I also did not know or didn't get to know, but I have a feeling there's some people on the panel who know something about him. Love it. <laughs> Bria, how do you know about Mr. Marshall? <laughs> Well, Mr. Marshall is my uncle. Um, yeah. yeah, it was my uncle. Um, I called him Uncle D or um, another name we had for each other was partner. There's this old commercial back in the 80s and I can't remember it, like all of it, but some little kid was trying to say partner and they couldn't say partner. They said partner or something. And so he used to always um, with that deep voice be like, howdy partner. And I would try to mimic him. And so um, he was my uncle partner um, and I was his partner. And so, um, yeah, my uncle and um, 
yeah, that's how I know. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so did you like when did you realize that your uncle sort of had, you know, this career in the arts and was around Pittsburgh killing it on the stages? Um, I kind of always knew, but I didn't know the magnitude because I was so young. So um like he was always traveling, he was always in and out. And um and so <laughs> it was like he wasn't there for like long stays of time, you know. Um, but and my family moved from the Western Pennsylvania area to the Northern California area. And so he was also very popular in the Bay Area as well, in Oakland and San Francisco. And so when I was younger, um, I knew like he was a performer, but I didn't really know what that was because I was so little. And um, my mom took me to see Steel City when I was very young. And I was too young to even understand what I was watching, but that's par for the course with my mother. And so <laughs> she would always take me to stuff like that. And then she, we'd have a conversation about it afterwards. And um, so I remember seeing him in Steel City and seeing him on the stage and there was like this big scaffolding thing and he was dancing around on it. And, um, and it really wasn't until I saw him in ropes and that I really understood what he did. And I was a tween, I was probably like 12 or something, I'm not even sure. And he was in it at City Theater. And my family also had, uh, my mom and my two aunts had a, a catering business at the time. And so they catered the opening night for Robeson. And um, I got to sit in the audience and watch. And I remember he sang, we are climbing Jacob's ladder and he sang it right to me. And I remember thinking in that moment, like, this is amazing. And if I can make people feel the way he's making me feel right now, I want to do this. And so that was really when it kind of clicked in. But I still didn't understand, like, how like everybody knew him kind of thing. It wasn't until I moved back to Pittsburgh and started working in the city and people would find out I was his niece. And they're like, oh, you're Don Marshall's niece? And then it was like, <laughs> kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. That is so awesome. What a wonderful legacy. What do you think his legacy was? Like, I mean, he was an actor, he was a writer. Uh, I, I imagine he probably directed people <laughs> to a degree as well, you know? I think um, I think there are a lot of people like him who are who helped shape Wilson Century Cycle, mm -hmm. and don't get a lot of credit or even airtime about it. You know, my uncle was one of the first levies, and um, you know, recently Mark Southers posted that picture of him on Facebook, um, him shaking hands with August and. Um, it was opening night of Ma Rainey um, at the Stephen, when it was Stephen Foster Hall. And um, there's a lot of artists and, and activists and people like that who had a hand in helping August Wilson create that century cycle and helping him shape those words and ideas. And I think he's part of that legacy. I think that's part of his legacy. And I think that's why it's so good that we're doing a panel like this. So we can talk about Bob Johnson. We could talk about my uncle. We could talk about Dr. Lilly because these people who really help shape the landscape and change the narrative of theater, not even just black theater, but theater in Pittsburgh and beyond. And so I think that's part of his legacy. And I also think um, legacy can also be an agent of inspiration as well. Like my uncle inspired me. And then that in turn is passed down to any of the actors or students that I work with, passing that down as well. So I think that's part of his legacy too. Mm. You could preach all day, Bria. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Cox, you, you said earlier that you worked with him. Um, Sometimes. Yeah, that? Uh, I know him more as a fellow actor, and we did um, Blues in the Night when they used to have the tent shows out at, um, was it Parkwood Acres? Oh, Acres. Mm -hmm. And there was Sandy Dow, uh, Maria Baycoats Bay was in for a while, and Denise, um, Denise 
Powell. Chef Powell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sheffy Powell and Don. And Don was the, uh, the the man in the alley or the man in the, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and when we would, he would save us. Uh, he saved us several times when we kind of lost it <laughs> on stage when uh, something would fly in somebody's mouth because it was outside. And Tomei Cousins was the choreographer and director for the show. Okay. And he was a lot of fun. And then at City Theater, I was looking up, we did Avenue X together mm-hmm. and he played my husband. And uh, <clears throat> that's when he was eating all that garlic. And <laughs> we had to, to hug and it was coming out of his pores. And I'm like, oh, dog, you know. <laughs> that's something he would do. <laughs> <laughs> he <just messed> with <laughs> I mean, I mean, I never smelled so much garlic in my life. I thought we had to get too close, can't get too close here. But he was, he was such a good actor and he was always there for you. You know, when you're on stage, he knew where you were supposed to be. He knew where he was supposed to be. You know, he was just, uh, and it was funny. He was very funny with that, that voice, uh, that commanding voice that he had. And we all, we loved him, especially when we did Blues in the Night because he's the only man in the show we were just like you know god you know he was just the he was great and uh, and then i saw that the one the man that lived underground that's the one you he was so good i was totally mesmerized by his performance and damn how does he making that stuff up how does he remember all that sometimes yes (laughs) (laughs) no because i actually got to act with my uncle once and yeah um it was this, I think it was a one night only um, performance that he did down in Beaver County where we're from. And um, my aunts rented out and my mom rented out a performance space and they catered dinner and then he did the show. And it was, yeah, and I was like, oh, I was so young and I played the cop. And I remember going through the script and I had my, my um, cue line my uncle was all over the place. <laughs> I did not know who my cue was. I was like, I'm my little self is in back. Okay. Like, did, he, did, he, did he call you partner? Did he, did he call you partner? Come on, partner. partner. Come on, partner. It's your cue. It's your cue. Come on. <laughs> he was good. He was very yeah. good. And yeah. Underground was, he and yeah. Mark created something wonderful with that show. Yeah. It was- yeah. I- I learned all about, you know, the shows that he devised and created based off of books and also off of concepts and, you know, with City Theater and Mark Masterson. And uh, and also Tomei told me that that was the first production he'd ever directed, um, mm-hmm. was Blues in the Night. <laughs> he was like, that was it. And he was like- Oh, you know, Blues first. in the Night was Tomei's first? Mm-hmm. Oh wow! He had, I, he had me dancing and singing all over the place. <laughs> well, that's how I met him. I was gyrating <laughs> things I didn't even know how to gyrate. I mean, it was like really crazy. It was fun. I know Tomei when he was a funky when he was a funky monkey. Oh, I'm going yeah. way back when we did the Wiz at Walt Harbor's attic, and I was Dorothy in the Wiz, and that goes back to like 1981 or something. And he was still at Point Park. I think he was 19. He and that Maria Bacotes Bay, they were very young folks. History, history. So May is going to watch this and he's going to be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and in her big mouth, what's she talking about? <laughs> yes, and, and Mr. Marshall was all, also a performer of the year in 1992. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, so, I mean, it's, look, I know we're talking a little bit about everybody, but this is to encourage the people watching to like go and investigate and to learn about these people. Because at this point, all you can do is learn, you know, and it's like learn and then use it, be inspired by it. And uh, the next person is someone who definitely inspired me quite a bit, Dr. Vernell Lilly. So I don't know, Shakira, did you ever get to work with or know Dr. Lilly or see any of Kuntu shows growing up in Pittsburgh? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm going to be honest. I don't, I don't know. Yes. So Dr. Lily was, uh, I mean, you just can't, everything comes to your mind. I think we could say her name, <laughs> you know, about her, but she uh, came from Texas, I believe, and then mm-hmm. started Kuntu Repertory Theater uh, on the campus of University of Pitt in 1974. And it lasted until 2013. 
and it was an African American run and led and uh, you know uh, stories that were told on stage and I believe that it was started as a platform so that the playwright Rob Penny who if you're watching this look up who Rob Penny is and then have your mind blown absolutely <laughs> the sheer amount of plays that he wrote and that was a platform to have his work uh, performed there as sort of a playwright in residence and uh, sort of born out of the, I think, Black Horizons Theater that he and August Wilson sort of started together. With Sala. Yes, with, with yep. Sala. Sala D. Yes. And then they had the, um, I believe, the Country Writers Workshop, which lasted for many, many, many right. years. And uh, so Dr. Lily and Rob Penny really, uh, that group, she used to always say it was Bob Johnson, Maisha Baton, uh, Charlie Williams, maybe. <laughs> and um, and Rob Penny, and they were, you know, and August Wilson, they were like the writers, they would sit around the table, write stuff, and then put it on. And I think that Kuntu uh, produced Homecoming, which was August Wilson's first play. I believe so. It, yeah. Yeah, so it's, I mean, the history of Kuntu, I, I, I met uh, Dr. Lilly when I was, I had auditioned for Radio Golf, and I had, um, and she and I had gotten into an argument in the audition room and, you know, while I was auditioning. So I went home and I was like, oh my goodness, what was that? And like a week later, she called me and I was working in the parking booth at City Theater at the time. In the oh, you don't work your way up. Well, look, praise them. <laughs> <laughs> praise them. I'm a testimony. Um, and she was like, bring that moxie you had with you at the audition. I want you to play old Joe. <laughs> and so... I'm like, what? And so it was hands down one of the most transformative experiences. I had never walked on stage in a play and had an audience react like that just by saying August Wilson's words and to have them, you know, like screaming for the story to not go the way it's got to go, you know, and things like that. And it was just a truly prideful moment because I came from Black theater. And so to come to Pittsburgh, I like had to seek it out and she was the Mecca. <laughs> she was, she was the place. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever work with her, Bria or Miss, Miss Cox? I did. Yeah. He, I'll tell you yesterday I was in my basement and there are things you have papers and books, but it's like somebody threw this plaque at me in my basement and it's, and I haven't seen this in years. And it said, come to repertory theater and dedicates this plaque to Etta Cox. What is from, I don't know, but it's from the Pittsburgh. And it, I mean, I haven't seen this in years. It just fell in front of me yesterday. Well, so it's like Benel Lilly said, if you go, you're going on that program tomorrow, you can talk about me or something. I, I haven't seen this thing in years. I, I don't even know where the Pittsburgh Vectors and, or something, but the country the repertory theater gave this plaque to me. But wow. the only time I really saw her work when she did um, Billie Holiday at the Crawford Grill, I believe. Uh -huh. And they did it down at our club at Dow's on Ninth, and Sandy Dow played Billy Holiday and Charlie Timbers and I saw her how she worked them I mean she worked them and they had dialogue up the wazoo and it was uh they worked hard and and she she was no nonsense she knew what she wanted and mm -hmm. she made you get there mm -hmm. you know and so okay. that's that was my um, and I, I've known her seen her different plays and things like that, but I've never really worked for Kuntu. Yeah, I, when I graduated college and then moved back to Pittsburgh for a little bit, I auditioned for her and um, that's when Eileen was there. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember who else was working there, but they had open auditions. And so I auditioned and it was an alumni hall and um, I, I sang something from St. Louis Woman, I think, I can't remember. And they asked me to hold on. I'm like, why do they want me to wait? And they called Dr. Lily because they wanted Dr. Lily to come to my audition and meet me. And so, um, and she was talking to me and stuff and she asked me about my people, who they were. And then I told her and she said, oh, I get it now. She was like, you, Mar she was like, you marshals. You marshals are tall and brown skin. And da, da, da. I was like, oh gosh. And so um, I ended up, she cast me in this play called She'll Find Her Way Home. Um, and that was actually the only play that I did with Kuntu, but I worked for 
her. I did some like temp work in the office for a couple of months. Um, but my dad, Harvey Johnson, he's a director. He actually directed Fortunes of the Moor um, at Kuntu back in, I think the nineties it was. So I've got a lot of family connection with Dr. Lily and Kuntu. Yeah, and that's the word family. It was like, you know, it's a, it was a, it felt like family when, I mean, we were all fresh out of college and they just opened their arms to us. And like you say, yeah, Doc did not play and didn't <laughs> suffer fools. And she would do it herself one time, you know, she was like, are you afraid of heights? I was like, yeah, yeah, I am. Like, you know, as tall as you are, I'm like, that's why, you know, you had any more height to me, it's scary. Brenda knows, <laughs> so he goes, okay. And we're rehearsing, I'm directing a play and all of a sudden I hear this clanking sound and I see her in the, in the wings, climbing the ladder to the, <laughs> to go to the, um, into like the, basically the top of the stage to change a light. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, well, you said you wouldn't do it. So. Well, <laughs> I'm going to do it myself. She didn't play. Yeah, she did not play. She was going to go okay. into the fly <laughs> to do it. Yes. So, I mean, there are so many memories and so many uh, people in the past that we certainly can honor. But I always look at how do we make sure that we continue that by pouring into the people who are here today and making sure that people feel you know, worthy today. So uh, this question is for Brendan and Shakira. Like everyone on here is an educator um, in a deep way, but you two are the youngest ones and yet you still do that as well. What made you both jump into being an educator? Oh, um, no, you got it. You got ladies <laughs> first, ladies first. <laughs> so sweet, so gentlemanly. Um, I would say I, I was kind of thrown in uh, H we found out that ATC is forever. <laughs> and uh, I was tasked with, um, well, do you want to teach these, the new kids that are coming in, you know, show them the way and direct the show. Uh, I was co-directing with Michael Curry and I really enjoyed it. I, re I just really loved being able to inspire people, young artists, the way that I was inspired and letting them know that their voice matters and that what they think and what they have to say about the world is so important and that they should take a lot of pride in that and to enjoy performing as much as I lo love performing. So I think that's, that's why I teach. Yeah, I, I I would agree. I'd, I'd second that. You know, for me, it it, it started with uh, just an an understanding and a remembrance for my great teachers that I had all the way up from elementary school to my collegiate days. And a theme that I found in all of them was they just had this incredible ability to make me feel seen and make me feel heard, and that. Like Shakira said, you know, I had a voice that um, didn't need to be quieted. As a matter of fact, I, I could have projected it more. And they were willing to, to, you know, guide me at times and also willing to push me at times. And and because of that, you know, I was I was thinking, you know, when I graduated, you know, what is something that I could do directly and something I learned is that you don't always necessarily use exactly what your degree is for. Um, and, and teaching was a great way to be able to connect with people. I got my degree in communications and, and being able to communicate with kids on a regular basis and help them navigate the world, how they can see the world through their eyes, um, you know, and, and help them project their voice was ultimately just kind of, you know, the push I needed to be like, you know what, no, I'm, I want to go by Mr. B now instead of Brendan. I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm ready to take on that Mr. title. It's all good. Yeah. So, and it's just a blast. I just really like it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I did not let students call me Mr. until about three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was new. It was brand new. I mean, no, like, like you said. Different. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a mental thing, right? I, I completely understand. I completely understand because it's how you see yourself. And then you get to a point when you're like, 
no, nah, no, nah, I put in some time with this and I know what I'm talking about. It's like, no, 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 you're going to call me. This is my preferred name. You're going to call me this. <laughs> right. I, I, try, I tried to go real smart with it. So like I did, like having just graduated from college, I went to elementary school. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't I didn't want to go to high school, you know, because they'd look at me like, bro, you're me. Like, what are you yeah. going to tell me to do <laughs> right now? And I'm like, uh, I mean, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, I went to the little kids because they see me as like just big bro, basically. <laughs> so Mr. B is 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 a little bit more casual. You know, I, I think of myself as the, the like uh, you, there's a player's coach. I'm like a student's teacher, you know, uh. like. You, I'm going to see you talking in the back. I know you're talking in the back, but it, 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 pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, Brendan, you had, I mean, I wouldn't say unconventional because how we found our way in is how we find our way in. But you found your way in the theater. I think, was it in college, like at Pitt, our great sponsor, mm -hmm. Pitt? Was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Yeah, yeah, it was. that change for you to go like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be an actor. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, it it uh, it was a change. I came to 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 Pitt to be an athletic trainer. Uh, I was an athlete in high school and 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 loved sports. I had a a couple offers to play college football, um, but I ultimately put that aside because I wanted to focus on my education and I wanted to push myself. and And Pitt was the the school that I thought could do that the best for me in in terms of you know just growing. Um, and then I realized very quickly that the sciences weren't for me <laughs> and um, I needed a, uh, a change. I needed to, to stay in the city that I had grown to love. Um, and I had an advisor who had seen that I had done um, uh, one spring musical my senior year of high school when she threw me into intro to performance uh, my first semester, my freshman year. Through there, that professor told me to audition. And I'm thinking like, if I played high school football for four years and I can't even play college football, I've never done theater. How am I supposed to do college theater? Like I was completely daunted at, at, at you know, what would that challenge be like? I'm going to be looking at the audience the whole time. I, I'm not going to be able to do it. And ultimately I, I decided, I was like, sure, shoot, I'll go through. And, and I got cast um, in, in a production of Rhinoceros. And it was so, so fun to, collaborate again and be a part of a team again my way into theater ended up being my athletic mentality you know rehearsals became practice show days became game days i warm up um tess you've seen me um bria you probably haven't seen me but i run the steps i, I do my old football warm-ups and my old football stretches pre-show because that's what my body knows is routine. Um, and so coming in, you know, through, from that angle, I always, you know, just tried to hold on to like the unique perspective of, yeah, this is what I got. This is where I'm coming from. And uh, let's see where we can go from here. Cause at Pitt, I had a, a wonderful uh, ground laid to be able to add tools to the, to the actor toolbox, so to say. Yeah. Yeah. It's been something. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's inspiring because I think a lot of people think that, you know, you got to be born with tap shoes on or something like that in order to, you know, do this. And that's not yeah. the case. And the reason why I brought up education is because I was seeing this thing going around Facebook. It was like, how old were you when you had your first black teacher? And I'm like, I was like four. Like, I grew up in Baltimore, you know? So, so, but I've realized that like, we're inspirations for a whole new generation who's going to grow up sort of only knowing that, you know, Barack Obama is the president and, you know, and their teachers are, you know, are black, but Bria, you're in a place uh, working at Pitt in the MFA program. And so like, what, like, can you tell us like basically what your role is as the MF, uh, you're the head of MFA and performance pedagogy at Pitt? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. I mean, it, it's interesting because I came into the position and like halfway through, they gave us notice that the program was going to be put on hiatus. Mm. Right. And so um, that created its own difficulty. And we weren't notified 
um, as to when it will return, only that it will return. So I have diligently been working in the in-between time to make sure that everything is buttoned up and together for when it does return. But when um, the program was active, I should say, with um, students, um, what I do is multifaceted. I mean, I, I help guide these MFAs through this intensive two-year training program. Um, and I make sure they meet their graduation goals, that they take their course requirements are fulfilled. Um, I've got to prepare them to teach their thesis courses. I, I, I help them um, think about what their thesis course is going to be and then facilitate how is that going to be taught, um, help them through their thesis process, through the defense of it. You know, I'm looking over pages and pages. Okay, you got pages due so-and-so day. And then, you know, I gotta be on them or your page, you've got your pages, you know, stuff like that. Um, and our program is very much tailored to the individual artist. And so what we're looking at is, well, what I should say, what we believe is that the professional artist already has a wealth of knowledge and um, artistry that is a good foundation for pedagogical technique. And so we accept people who are in their careers and are looking to open up another option for them in their lives. Um, and these people are not in any way jaded or um, disillusioned by this, this thing that we do that is performance, but they are educators and they know they have something to offer um, by educating and they wanna educate at the, the academic level, at the university level. So we're also teaching them how to be a faculty member. Um, um, I've helped, I've, the, the students that I had, I helped them through um, some application processes and things like that. Um, and our program is very much tailored to, because we only accepted two students every other year, it's very much tailored to the individual person. So um, we have a set curriculum, but within that curriculum, there are certain courses that's kind of like, okay, what is your emphasis? What are you passionate about? Okay, now let's, let's dig into that and look at different pedagogical techniques of how to teach that at the university level. And so in a nutshell, you know, among a lot of other administrative stuff that I won't get into, <laughs> that's kind of like Cliff Notes version of what I do. So like I said, while we're in this downtime, um, I'm making sure there's like no holes in the curriculum that all of our matrices are where they need to be with assessment and admissions. So when the university is like, okay, thumbs up, you can start admitting again, mm -hmm. um, we're ready to go. Oh, that's great. So people better be ready to have their applications mm -hmm. to go <laughs> so that they can get that good education. Absolutely. Yes. Ms. Cox, I have a question for you. Do uh -oh. any of your students come in knowing who you are like knowing that they're like no oh man that's probably for the better that's probably for the better though no it's like during the course of the year they start finding out little things or i might do something they said this guy said were you in a show were you in this movie i know my mom was watching this movie and it's this is cox you know so it's like you know they find out and then they google you mm. and that's how they find out the different things that i've done you know because uh, i never say anything and they just call me this jazz, this, uh, um, they'll go, Miss Cox, shooby dooby 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 doo. That's what they think, you know, they just scat sing all the time. So, but, uh, <laughs> how but old are the students? How old are they? These are high school. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not the shooby dooby dooby doo. Not the yeah, shooby, yeah. right. Not the and they know that I teach, um, well, I, I teach private vocal, but I also teach jazz history. And, uh, what was it the other day? They said, this, oh, this one little girl said, I was talking to my mother and I said, uh, I had given her a song. She said, how do you, how do you know Anna Cox? She said, she's my teacher. She's your teacher. She's, they don't even know that, you know, that I teach, but it's, it's okay. It's no, it's no big deal. And then they start asking questions and they're very, very curious about, especially about the movies. How much money did you make? You know, oh. that kind of, mm -hmm. I'm a Pittsburgh. What do you think? <laughs> 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 but um, they're, they're, they're cute. And, and I, I love them. I, I mean, I probably should have retired, but I, I'm there, I'm adjunct, I'm there three hours a day and we're still teaching, you know, virtual. 
-hmm. and I have a jazz recital every year and this this time of year and I didn't get to do it last year but prayerfully we'll get to do a virtual this year but there I, I love these kids and you know, to watch them grow vocally you know from freshmen and most of them live this in sixth grade because we're now six through 12 okay. and uh, they have to audition to get into high school and even if they got in they were there for those three years it doesn't mean you automatically get into high school mm -hmm. but we just had auditions uh, what was it, a couple of weeks ago and um I, I would hope I would live long enough to see what this one kid's going to do. He, he was the best audition. His name was Bataji. He was so good. And he's going into, he'll be in sixth grade, but he's just so, he was so personable and so smart. And he just sang and they were, and he was African-American. And we don't get that many African-American boys that want to audition for a performing arts school. But when we do get them, they're usually very, very good. And this kid is, is going to be exceptional. So. That's why you, you hang around and uh, you watch them. And it, it's, it's such a pleasure because I enjoy it. I didn't, I, my degree is in music education and voice, but um, I didn't start out singing jazz. I sang classical music. And it just so happened that I did a thing for the Manchester Craftsman's Guild. And I got this old tape. I said, could you digitize this for me? And they did. And it was me singing all these arias from La Boheme and, and I mean, I had this really high voice. <laughs> I'm sitting, hitting high C's like nothing. I keep kidding, you know. Now it's like I'm in low C's. But I, <laughs> I enjoyed listening to myself when I was 21, singing all these arias. And so I teach that also at Kappa. And I think some of the teachers there didn't realize that I sang that much classical music. They just thought I sang jazz. I didn't sing jazz so I moved to Pittsburgh. And that was a long time ago. I never listened to it. It was never in my home. It was either gospel or classical. That was it. So um, I enjoyed hearing my, my young self and thinking, hmm, what if I stuck with the classical? But I do love jazz. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if there's a, uh, you know, a classical award that someone can win for eight years in a row in Pittsburgh. So <laughs> <laughs> you might have, you I'm, know, made the night right decision. The right decision. I'm self-taught. I mean, I, I I would learn the old way. I didn't go to school for jazz, but mm -hmm. I mean, I learned it on the street, getting out there and doing it and, and learning all the, um, the vernacular. I just did a, a, a thing on Charlie Bird and all you ever hear about Charlie Bird were his drugs and, and you know, right. and so heroin. But I let the kids know that was really by accident because he was in a violent car accident and they gave him um, heroin back then. It was like 1937 or something, 33. He was addicted, not because he wanted to, they just, and he needed it, you know, mm -hmm. that he, he died when he was 34, but it wasn't because I'm a musician and I'm going to do drugs. You know, he had to have it because he was in so much pain most of his life. And he was a teenager when he started on the hero and when he was in that car accident. So, and uh, just like the new movie of Billie Holiday that's coming out, you mm -hmm. know, they know about her drug addiction. They didn't know about the people that were after her and you know, strange fruit. And she didn't really write it, but I think a Jewish guy wrote it, but she had something to do with it. And it's just this whole black history now, because when I was in school, we didn't have no black history. Mm. No, we didn't have, there was no black history, you know, and there was, we didn't like, you barely said the word black because mm. I'm from way back when it was colored, Negro, you know, black. And my, my grandmother, I said, no, granny, it's not colored. It's Negro. She said, colored Negro. I don't know what to call it. So, you know, then it became African-American, you know, so we, <laughs> we're just so confused. Who are we? You know, but I think now this generation is, is figuring it out. And I had a black teacher from, from kindergarten through, uh, cause I went to all black school. Mm -hmm. And then my parents got tired of me to fight. So they put me to Catholic school. Then I went to all white school yes. and I did, I didn't know anything about Catholics and my dad said, do what they do. So I went to Catholic high school and college and, uh, but I never converted. Wow. I'm, I got, I'm with you there. I'm, I'm getting out of it. <laughs> I was born into it. I'm you were born out. into it? Yeah, yeah. But we can talk, that'll be on our uh, Easter. Um, <laughs> oh, <there> <laughs> celebrate. <laughs> Did he feel it celebrates Easter? Um, so, um, Speaking of educators, so uh, Shakira, did you, and I just assumed this was the case, but did you work with Bill Nunn, the, uh, the actor Bill Nunn? I did. I did. I'm, I'm grateful to be able to say that I did. Yes. How did you meet him? Like, what was that experience like? Uh, I think 
that he somehow found out about ATC either from coming to our first show, which I, I believe it was he came to our first show. Mm-hmm. And he just, he liked us. He liked us. He thought we were talented. And Hallie Donner, our executive producer, um, approached him and he was he was down with being a mentor for her and and he was cool with um being in it might have been our second show ever um a play by uh Devon Robinson and he played this teacher um, and I wasn't in that show. I I was, but I was. I worked with him when um, we did a non saving glue man at uh, the Kelly Strayhorn. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but I, I'd say that one of my fondest memories of working with him would be um, when we were working on this show that had a lot of August Wilson monologues in it. Um, and he was working with the boys and they were singing that song um we wanna ewa, wanna birda, birda. oh yeah birda birda yeah birda, birda. yeah love that song never knew mm-hmm. the words but <laughs> um he after um you know they were done and and someone did their monologue, he was like, take, take your, take your moment after, take your moment after, after, let it, let it, let it saute on their asses. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's just like a famous thing nice. that mm-hmm. we sometimes just say every now and then because, because of Bill and because of that. And, um, he was mm. a really incredibly cool person. So, he was just so energetic and inspiring and a real air to be around. Yeah, yeah. He really was. He re- it, I, I've cracked up when you said a not say in the gloomin because he um, he came to Point Park and did a master class and we was like, oh snap, the man from Sister Act is here. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got to ask him about Whoopi Goldberg. He's like, you asked me about Whoopi Goldberg, I'm standing right here. <laughs> And he was like, you know, he basically was like, I like y'all. And he came and uh, directed a May show, but they, you know, they had their May shows, the two, and then they created one that was specifically going to be just for a Black cast. And Bill was going to direct it. And so we spent, uh, you know, a couple months um, in rehearsals with him. And it was a Nancy and the Glue Man. And uh, we were cast in the show, but then he was like, we're going to have a week of exercises and I'm going to see which parts you're going to play. So it was like another round of auditions the first week. Then we got the cast list and I'm like, look down and I was the glue man. And I'm like, looking through the script. <laughs> like, I don't have any lines. He was like, yeah, you're gonna dance. And I was like, I'm a what? <laughs> you're gonna dance. You're gonna be the dancer in the piece. And I'm like, sir, I don't know. <laughs> but it was that belief in me, you know, and just the idea of just the sense of play. He's like, I don't, I mean, Ron Hudson cared if I got it right, but he was like, I don't care if you get it right, just play, just be. So he had that in him. He always had that sense of play and was quick with you could, you know, you say something to Bill, he could get back at you quick. Oh my goodness, so quick. (laughs) It's amazing how, you know, we've had so many experiences with these people who were just so generous. And that's the one thing that even calling all of you, you all said yes immediately. And I just find that that spirit in our community is not lost, but I want us to, you know, live in that and continue to exude it. So we don't have too much more time, but I'm going to do some rapid fire questions to everyone and then kind of see what kind of comes to your mind. So we're going to start with Brendan. Brendan, you were actually in One Night in Miami at City Theater, but you're actually in the movie too. Tell us about that. 
So real quick, uh, Kemp Powers, the playwright, uh, basically emailed every actor that had been in a theatrical production of it from Pittsburgh to LA to London, wherever One Night in Miami was done on the stage, Kemp sent an email to the actor saying that he was inviting them to be in a scene in the movie. Uh, it's the final scene, one of the final scenes when um, they actually go down to the diner. Uh, that scene is not in the play because the play only takes place in the room. Uh, and so it was kind of like an homage to the theatrical actors that had uh, uh, laid the groundwork for the movie to kind of happen in the first place. And I was super, super blessed. And I got to shout out my mom. Thank you, mom. I love you for helping me out getting down there. But I was able to go to New Orleans and, and, and be in the production. And for me, it was it was just... I just wanted to be a sponge, you know, in, in, in the room. I I got to sit next to Leslie Odom Jr. I got to meet Ben Kingsley. I got to meet Aldous Hodge. Um, my last, I'll end with a little quick, because I know we're doing quick questions. My last little thing is I got to talk to Regina King, um, like one-on-one, -on -one, and I made her laugh. And that, yeah, that I, I was really happy about that. So <laughs> it was an absolutely wonderful experience being in the production at City Theater that provided me the opportunity to go down and, and even you're going to see my profile. It's literally just going to look like this in the screen. That's all you see. But it was just a wonderful experience. You were in it. There. You were right. there. All right. Beautiful. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm going to freeze frame the profile next time and just yeah. you know, get it blown mm -hmm. up. Send it to mm -hmm. everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Big screen debut right there. Right. So Bria and Ms. Cox, you both have been in productions of Crowns. Uh, which admittedly is a play I have never seen, but I like, which is crazy because it's done so much. And I think it was even done at City Theater um, that uh, you were in it, Ms. Cox. Yeah. Why, why do we think Crown stands the test of time? Why is the show still around? Ah, uh, it's because it's, it's the, um, the black legend of the black ladies, the black church ladies with the big hats. And um, we did it, the, same year as Katrina. So what would that be? 2000, I can't remember. Five, five so something like four or five. five. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was so much fun doing it. I had, I forgot my role, but I had the hat and somebody had the same hat I had, you know, and I was, that, that, that character just lost it, you know, and I got to do the church dance and <laughs> it's just, it's real. I don't know if this is relevant now because I haven't been to a lot of black churches because, um, growing up, of course, but, you know, everything is so mixed together anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but it back then, yeah, you had to have your, your hat on to go to church. <laughs> had to have that head covered. You know, my grandmother had a lot of hats. All our neighbors had hats. So I'm from Missouri. Back then, yeah, you always had to have the hat. So and the people that would come to see the performance, they, they knew that. They loved it. Mm -hmm. and, and then it was new for some people. They didn't know about the, the church ladies and the hats. And on my, my table, I have a um, coffee table book called crowds yep oh but it was wow. based off of mm -hmm. yeah or inspiration yeah no yeah. i can tell you it is absolutely relevant now um and i'm gonna work backwards because um fleetwood jordan theater which i am a um, associate artistic producer of my partner tim is a producing artistic director and we co-directed the production about two summers ago i think it was um i can't remember the exact date but no, 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 no. Houses were packed, honey, yeah. packed, packed, <laughs> packed. It was a good old time. And he yeah. had this wonderful idea where um, he got some of the um, Black women seniors in the community to do a photo shoot in their hats. And we have it up on the wall in the dining room. And they looked regal and glorious they looked amazing and one woman miss turner she's in her late 90s maybe she's 100 i can't remember she had this huge black and white hat on honey she was mother <laughs> it was amazing and you no know, people came and they celebrated and being able to celebrate those women who are pillars in the community yeah. i think that is still palpable now you know and and it's also a coming of age story for Yolanda, right? Mm -hmm. um, Yolanda 
she's trying to find herself and she finds herself in her own crowns. And so mm -hmm. she may not wear the hats that her grandmother, Mother Shaw wears to church and whatnot. She talks about how she wears her gay lays and her head wraps and her brother's baseball cap and things like that. And so we talked about legacy at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? That's that legacy that gets passed down that is still yeah. palpable today. And I, um, I understudied it and went on at the Denver Center back when BJ, BJ Crosby was in it, when she was alive, Miss Gretha Boston, who's amazing, Uzo, um, C.E. Smith, like there were a bunch of juggernauts in the show. And um, I had to go on one night and I just remember the electricity, no, not one night, it was like a weekend or something. And it was the, the electricity from the audience was just, it's a, it was amazing. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Like, and like Miss Etta said, there's people who are introduced to this tradition that's a part of our community. They don't know right. about the crowns and these hats and how important they are. And so they're introduced and they're all in. They're all yeah. in. <laughs> from beginning to end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here, uh, what about, okay, so recently um, ATC partnered uh, with uh, City Theater Company with the Breath Project. And uh, would you mind telling everyone sort of what the Breath Project is and what your what ATC's contribution to it was? Yes, so the Breath Project is a archive, was an archive, is an archive and a festival of people of color that work in theaters and do theater from all over the country that created an eight minute and 46 second piece, which is the same length of time that the George Floyd video was. And it was all to um, talk about um, injustice and the um, police brutality that um, happens in our community and kind of an effort to make it even even bigger to talk about it and to help stop it. And our ATC's um, contribution was that we made a video to submit to the Breath Project. I was the uh, director of this piece. Um, I kind of put together the blueprint of what of how it was gonna go and what we were gonna talk about. And we talked about uh, Breonna Taylor and I had each of the students that said, okay, you are, you're her brother, you're her mom, you're Breonna and had all of them tell the story, had them like look up the facts of the situation and tell the story from those different perspectives. And we pieced it together and they were amazing. And the Breath Project, is amazing and I encourage people to look into it into the archive and watch those videos and I believe that people can still submit um, to be a part of the archive and can possibly submit to get a, a play that is inspired by the 846 pieces done when we can be together again and have live theater yeah yeah for sure well i think we're coming up close to it and i know we had a whole bunch of i was ambitious with this agenda <laughs> you were good i, I was, was not mad i was ambitious with it but i feel like this only means that more of these conversations have to happen right they must happen between these generations so that we can learn grow uh so i guess um Let's end it on a positive note in the sense of like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna eventually ask Ms. Cox, what do you think younger generations should know? Just, I mean, you know, you could think artists, you know, I'm not artists, but what do you think they should know? And then I'm gonna ask Brendan and Shakira, what do you need from the generations who've come before you? I just think they should know and have a respect for those that went before them you know, because just in knowing our history, because that's something I didn't have growing up. I didn't really know because there was no black history out there, but know where we came from and, and what we can do and how resilient we are and what a wonderful uh, 
people we are. I just bought the 400 years, uh, the book 400 years, and it's all the poems and it is wonderful. And so you, you find out, well, it makes you proud. And I think that our, our the generation to come, be proud, be, be proud, be, have, keep that pride and the humility. That's what I think. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's, I, I think hearing that from you, especially Ms. Cox is just so inspiring because I think that what I was gonna say that we need is um, your wisdom, you, you to share, you know, so we can hold on to that history. Um, I would say that, I don't wanna speak for Shakira as well. We're, we're kind of in that very me, middle of Gen Z millennial, kind of like right yeah, in between. I think we're so I don't know. Millennials. Yeah, yeah, like I don't really know yeah. which one to claim because I'm like right there in the middle. But I, we, we, you know, we have that stigma of kind of being lazy and, and, and needing instant gratification and whatnot. Um, we struggle searching for the history because all this information is directly accessible to us. So hearing it from your from your mouths and, and hearing your words, I think is what we need. And then the last thing we need, I'll, I'll pass it to Shakira, is opportunity. You know, opportunity. Let us have our successes. Let us make our mistakes. Um, you know, let us be successful on small stages. Let us mess up on a big stage. Um, all those are incredible learning opportunities. And so I think, like I said, we need your words, your wisdom, and then um, the opportunity to show you that we know that wisdom. Mm, very good. Make your opportunities too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that is right, yeah. Uh, I actually, you you hit the, hell, the nail right on the head. I, I don't think that there's anything I can say that isn't, that could be said better than that. That is, I think, exactly what we need. And yeah, that's exactly what we need. I, that was the question I actually, I was struggling to think of what to say. I said, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just want you to, to tell us your stories and mm -hmm. and he, just hear from you and be around you and, and soak up everything that you have to offer so that we can continue the legacy, so we can show other people the way. Remember that old people have lots of stories. <laughs> I have all kinds of stories. I love stories. I never stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take a story. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, uh, it's something that you said, Ms. Cox, about creating your own opportunities. And that, to me, I think is like my generation, you know, I'm like, I, I want us to keep doing that and keep pushing yeah. to do that and to keep that door open as yeah. it was held open for us and to have grace, you know, <laughs> and knowing that, mm -hmm. you know, cause sometimes you can feel a little stuck like, oh, I wanna be in this spot or I know I'm not where I used to be, but I'm not where I wanna be. And uh, just about having grace and keep creating opportunities. Bria, yeah. any last words from you? Well, I, cause I was gonna ask you Montez what you thought about that and you kind of answered that cause I'm very much of that mindset. I no longer subscribe to the idea of I wanna seat at the table. For me, it's like, let's just build our own damn table, yep. right? Make my own stuff. And then maybe you need to come sit at my table, yes. right? So that's where I'm at. Like make your own table, make your own work. Don't wait, don't continually wait for other folks to make opportunity to make things happen. You know, just like this panel here, Montez had an idea and you let it come to fruition and, and you put it out there, right? You contacted each of us and each of us was like, yes. Okay, when, you know, when is it happening? What do you need, you know, kind of thing because we all understand the importance of things like this. And so, you know, we're of, we're the same age, and and I think we're we're at that stage of two of us where it's like, you know, make your own damn table. Make your own yeah. damn table. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, thank you all so much for taking the time for coming out and for well, coming out. You at home? Thank you for <laughs> thank you for sitting in front of your computer at home <laughs> and doing this. Thank you to thank the audience you. who's watching for uh, participating. Thank you to the City Theater staff um, 
for being so generous and Mark Masterson for who has such one day I'm gonna get Mark on Zoom and we're just gonna talk all things city. All the things. Because <laughs> he has a, a treasure trove of history regarding oh, yeah. here and Pitt. And um and you know and the allies who create the create some of the lanes and opportunities and who give up their seats that's important as well during this time. So we didn't get into some of the other stuff, but I feel like there may be a part two coming. But um, right after this, what's going to happen is that we're going to hear from Pastor Derek Tynes and his arrangement of We Shall Overcome that is so poignant and new. And it's just the theme, we will overcome all of this, this pandemic, this racial and social injustice, this uh, stage is being closed. We're going to be back and we're going to be better yeah. than ever. And we can't wait to see you all in person. And maybe a year from now, do this on a nice big stage with, <laughs> <laughs> with a whole bunch of people. So thank you all. Love you all. Love to you all. And thank you. Have a wonderful and blessed night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Montez, you. so, so much. much.